Now, what about the tangent function? Well, the tangent function actually is one that I do want to tell you a little bit about for a second, because um, its function is actually much more exotic. The tangent function, I now remind you, looks like this. Look at that. Now, first of all, what's going on there? You notice, first of all, it's in a lot of pieces, right? There's a piece that goes like this, and then all of a sudden it jumps down to here. Now, I don't know if you can see this line or not. There's a very, very fine line drawn here. You probably can't see it over the web. But that's actually an asymptote. We'll talk about asymptotes in the graphing section later. But that's a line that this tangent function wants to approach but never actually touches. It keeps going off to here to infinity and here down to negative infinity. Why isn't the tangent defined there? Well, because remember the tangent is sine over cosine. So if we wanted to see what tangent equals at pi over 2, I'd have to plug in pi over 2 in for sine and cosine. So I have sine of pi over 2 over cosine of pi over 2. But look at cosine of pi over 2. It's 0. So we'd have something divided by 0. That's undefined. So in reality, we don't cross this line. That's an asymptote. And the tangent function very gracefully starts down at negative infinity and gradually goes up to 0 and then continues upward like this to this asymptote and then keeps repeating that process again and again and again. So the tangent graph we can see easily by thinking of it as sine over cosine. So that's pretty neat. Now, the very last thing I want to tell you about these functions is, um, well, the values at, at certain famous points. A lot of times you want to find the values at, uh, at some big, value, big, big points. Let me tell you the, the values that you should, you should know for certain. You should know, I'll write them first in degrees. You should know the trig functions at 0 degrees, at uh, 30 degrees, at 45 degrees, at 60 degrees, and at 90 degrees. You should know all the trig value functions just off the top of your head for those values, at least. Now let me convert them to the language of calculus. Let me convert those to radians. This would be 0 radians. And you could try this on your own by just looking at the conversion that pi equals 180. This is going to give you pi over 6 radians. This will give you pi over 4 radians, like we saw before. This will give you pi over 3 radians. This will give you pi over 2. These are all radians. And if you don't believe me here, for example, take pi over 3 and now multiply that by 180 over pi. If you imagine putting in a 180 over pi here, let's just do that one for fun so you can see that. If I put in a 180 over pi, What do you see? The pi's cancel, and 3 goes into 180 60 times. So in fact, you see 60 degrees. So, OK, now what, uh, what are the trig functions for, for, these, uh, for these values? Well, well, I'll tell you how a lot of people, in fact, probably most people, in fact, maybe all people, uh, remember these things. What they do is they draw, they draw this picture. They draw the, the, um, the xy plane. And they put a unit circle right there in the center. And they start to draw these lines, you know, like this. And they read, it, they read it off somehow. And they put things here. And then they use the Pythagorean theorem. And I think that's great. That's great if that works for you. But this has never made sense to me, personally. So I'm going to show you my own method for remembering these angles. Because remember, I think I've mentioned this already. I don't like memorizing things. So this is a method that I actually invented, believe it or not, when I was in high school. Because I hated memorizing things even back then. And so here's the method. It's the, like the, the world's, I think, shortest and, in my opinion, easiest way of remembering all the trig functions. So first of all, what do I do? I'm going to put the angles here. And then I'll put sine here. And I'll put cosine here. And the first observation is all I need is sine and cosine. If I know sine and cosine, I know everything. You want tangent, it's sine divided by cosine. You want cosecant, it's 1 over sine. You want secant, it's 1 over cosine. You want cotangent, it's cosine over sine. So if you just know these guys, then you're all set. OK, so let's make a little chart here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in um, the, the famous angles we want. So 0, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3 and pi over 2. Those are the angles in radians in increasing order. Now I'm going to make a little chart right here for you live. Live on the fly. You get to watch me. It's sort of fun. Here the information superhighway is working so hard to crunch and share with you all these gigabytes or megabytes or maxibytes just so you can watch me draw these lines. <laughs> sort of wasteful, but who cares? What the heck? Anyway, there's the chart. 
And now here's how you fill it in, and I think this is really sort of fun. So what you do is, what you do is, you remember just one basic slogan. The sine is good, the cosine is bad. So the sine is sort of the good, the good sort of B, and the cosine is sort of the, the dark sheep of the family. Well, step one is to first of all divide everything through by two. Just everywhere on this table, just write divided by two. Don't think about it, just divide everything through by two. So that's pretty easy. Just divide everything through by two. Not a problem. And then to find the values, all you do is just count. What could be easier than counting? What I want you to do is I want you to count. I want you to count, start up here at zero, and I want you to count. I want you to start counting though at zero. So zero, one, two, and count that way. And the only rule is just count under a square root. So first write the square root symbol and then count. So here I'd write square root of zero. Here I'd write square root of one. Here I'd write square root of two. Here I'd write square root of three. Here I'd write square root of four. What could be easier? Here I do the same thing, but remember cosine is that one that's that rebel without a cause. So what I'm going to do with cosine is count, but I'm going to start counting backwards because cosine is trying to be sort of cool. So square root of zero, square root of one, square root of two, square root of three, square root of four. And that's it. Believe it or not, that is it. Because if you notice, square root of zero is zero over two, that's just zero. This is just square root of one, which is one, so this is one half. This is the square root of 2 over 2. This is the square root of 3 over 2. And the square root of 4, of course, is 2. And 2 divided by 2 is 1. So there's all the trig values for sine at these different angles. And similarly, if you work backwards here, you see the same kind of thing. In fact, if you're really good, what I've been doing, since I've been doing this you know, for about you know, 60 years since I was a kid, uh, what I do is I just memorize the sine thing and realize that cosine is to read it backwards. So in fact, when I'm doing calculations, I'm just thinking this one column and thinking down and then remember it's backwards and forwards. Anyway, that's my warped little way of remembering the basic trig functions at these points. Um, probably it's better for you to actually use a little circle method if you understand that. And maybe one day you can type in an, a message to me on this thing and explain it to me. I'd love to learn about it. But until then, I'm sticking with this old thing that I invented back when I was in high school. That's a, sort of a, a basic uh, overview of trig business. And now what I want to do is take a look at the calculus of the trig functions. So I'll see you over at the calculus section of trig. Okay, bye.